Let's see, could I have, hmm, let's see, could I have maybe two, you, you and you, could you come up here and just stand right here real quick and hold on to this? You got it? Okay, you come to one end, you come to the other end. Um, let's see, Mr. Logan, could you come up here? Come on around from behind, stand right there. Perfect. You don't have to hold it. The ladies will support it for you. But yeah, ladies, could you lift it up a little bit? Can you come up to this as if you're wearing sunglasses? There you go. Okay, just hold that for a minute. A moment ago in our reading from Jesus, we heard that uh, about a speck and, and a, a piece of wood. The piece of wood in Greek is like a tent peg. It would be like the, the thing that either you're securing your, your tent with or the thing that's in the middle of your tent making the whole thing stand up. A big piece of wood, a strong piece of wood. And he's saying, people like to put a piece of wood right in front of their eyes, or they're, they're holding onto a piece in their eyes, but if you dip down just a little bit, Logan, can you see what your sister's color of her pants are? What color? Purple, yep, yep. Can you see what's on her shoes at all? Yes, they're, they're red, pink, purple, white. Pink and purple and white, pretty good, pretty good, yeah? Not bad, you can see some things if you're hanging out behind a two by four. But can you see everything? Can you see all the people in the back? No? Yeah. So it's crazy. Jesus said that's what it's like when we're holding on to a sin and trying to point out somebody else's sin. Right? Like, like if, if my mic was off or something like that, it was, if it was really hanging down weird, I would love it if somebody could help me correct that. But he's not going to be able to see that, right? So Jesus' encouragement is to take this plank and just take it down. Can you bring it down? And deal with it, and then maybe take it off to the side. Can you move it off over here to the side? And then you're good. All right, you're good. Thank you for your help. Mr. Logan, can you see everybody in the back now? Can you see everybody in the front? If somebody had pie on their face, you'd be able to tell them? Pie or, or like a big spot on the side, yeah? Nice, okay, you can have a seat. Jesus says, this piece of wood, this big chunk, is like the sins that are in our own lives that we don't want to deal with. Instead, we'd rather... Look at somebody else. Do you ever have that happen to you? Or did you ever do that to somebody else? Here's what it sounds like. Maybe I, I've noticed a little something. Don't tell my family. But uh, in, at, at uh, around 8.30 at night, sometimes I hear one of my children tell the other child, hey, dad told you to get off the screen. You should put that screen away. It's time you put that screen away. And that's coming from the child who should be brushing their teeth. Does that ever happen? Yeah? Like, you can see something that somebody else should be doing, but you're not dealing with, with your own thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really easy also for, like, religious people to do that, too. At Jesus' time, there were the people called the Pharisees, and they thought they were, like, high up here on doing what God wanted to do. They couldn't see their own sin, but they could sure point to other people and the problems that they were doing. And Jesus said it's hypocrisy. It's like play acting. It's like having a big old four by four in your eyes vision. And you can't really give them help. You can't really give them guidance. So what do you think would be a better way? How do you deal with this two by four of your own problems first? Hmm. How would you deal with that? I think with, with my kids, I would encourage them, right, to say, hmm, I'm going to go up on my way to brush my teeth. Mom, I'm going to brush my teeth, and I just noticed, I talked to my brother or sister about it. They're still on their screen. They're kind of dragging their feet. But I'm going to go do what I need to do. I'll let you take care of it however you need to. You think you could do that? Oh, that would be so hard. But I think you could. I think when you are following the path that the Lord has for you and when you have laid your sins down before him, all of a sudden it frees you up to not have this pressure that you have to force them to do what you think they should do. Instead, you can come alongside and say, hey, I know what it's like to not want to listen to mom and dad. I can relate, right? But I found it's actually a lot better if you do. So if you, if you actually talk to mom and dad and say what happened, you can clear the air and we can go on and it's going to work. And then instead of being like enemies with your siblings, you're actually on the same side. And, and it's amazing how God blesses that. 
Again, all made possible because what Jesus did on a bigger piece of wood, on the cross, where he laid himself down and he took the punishment our sins deserved. Our sins are paid. So, tonight, today, this week, focus in on confessing your sins to your Lord first. Focus in on things that maybe aren't right with you that you want to bring to God for him to heal, and then you'll be able to handle some of the other people around you in love. That's a hard order, a tall order, something that God works. So let's ask for him to do that for us. Let's fold our hands, please. Just because we don't have to fold our hands when we pray, but we do it because sometimes our hands get distracted if they're wandering. So we fold our hands and we close our eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross. Thank you for taking the payment our sins deserve. Thank you for giving us brothers and sisters and friends and parents and family and friends. Lord, sorry for those times we want to point out all the other things and faults of other people and forget our own. You have paid for all of our sins in full and we thank you for that. Now help us to come alongside of others who need to hear some grace, who need to hear about your sacrifice. Help us to do that starting at home and then work our way out from there. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Today, we're back on for Sunday School. Right on now. Those teachers are eager with smiles on their faces. That's great. And they will keep those smiles as long as you pick your children up after the service. That would be great. So, all right. Awesome. All right, as we get into God's Word today, just a reminder that you have that worship handout, some fill-in-the-blanks. You can jot down some, some notes as we're getting into God's Word. The same thing's available in YouVersion Bible app. You go to the events portion, and then uh, you go to this location, and then you'll see the same thing in digital format. So you can take those notes with you wherever you take your phone, which is everywhere. And then every time you get along to the scripture reading that we're going to read today, you'll be able to jog your memory with those same notes. Because we're doing something rather special in this series. We're going to read a whole book of the Bible. And not just the whole book of the Bible reading it, we're also going to dig into it and understand it, and maybe even potentially be able to explain it to someone else. No, it's possible. We can do this. All right, ready? Let's get in. First, a question, though. How could they... What were they thinking? I don't think I could ever trust them again. I certainly could never forgive them. Have those words crossed your lips or maybe come through your mind? Some of those questions like, I, I don't really, I can't believe it. it. It happens along your life, and if you live long enough, it'll happen probably several times. Because people you trust are sinner saints, even people inside the church that you feel friends with and that you've been getting along, one thing can happen that all of a sudden derails it. And you can be frustrated, and it can sever ties, and it can cause all sorts of issues. It happens. It definitely happens. Uh, no one knows that more than that old guy in the picture. At this point, this old guy, Paul, was sitting in jail in chains, and he's writing letters to mission churches that he had helped start and specific people. He knows what it's like to be incarcerated, and it wasn't his fault. He did nothing wrong. In fact, he's in jail for sharing the gospel of Jesus. He's in jail for doing what was right and good, and the sin and the devil and the world, they just didn't want to see that. But he could also look back in his life and how he caused pain to other people. Initially, he thought he was pursuing God's will, and he was persecuting the church. And he was going to have people arrested, and he was there giving approval when Stephen was stoned to death, the first martyr. He was part of that. He knew what it was to suffer under the hands of others. He knew what it was to be the one who was causing that suffering. And he knew how hard it was to forgive, that it really was a miracle. And that's why he writes this letter that we're going to read today, a letter to the guy named Philemon. So let's open that up. Let's check it out. A whole book of the Bible in one sitting. Are you ready? Philemon, chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. 
I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold in order to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It's none other than Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that, so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not be seen forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greeting. And so do Mark and Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. You, we did it. We just conquered a book of the Bible. Easy peasy. Kind of an odd little book, isn't it? Odd little letter. I mean, just a little, like, dear Philemon, and, and here's a little issue, and then sending it away. It seems odd that such a small thing without much context is shared for the ages. That's included in God's word, that God's message was coming through somebody who knew what it was to be hurt and to be the hurter on forgiveness. But it's pretty powerful, once you understand the context, that there was this guy named Onesimus, who was a slave in the household of Philemon. Now, when we think servant or slave, I think in our context in America, we would think African-American and what had happened in the South and all of that. Um, in the Roman Empire, it had less to do with race than it did to do with, like, if somebody couldn't pay their debts, if they were incarcerated for some, doing something wrong, or if they were a conquered people, they would be enslaved. Um, so Onesimus was a slave for whatever reason, but he didn't stay that way. He escaped. But before he escaped, it appears that he also stole something from Philemon. So if you're going to make a modern comparison, I would say think about somebody who works for you or works with you. Somebody you trust with your house. So this is maybe somebody who's cleaning your house. Or maybe somebody you work with who, when you're on vacation, they can come into your house and they can take care of everything, water the animals, etc. And you find out that while you were gone, they took... A lot of stuff. Everything. And then they ran. And they ran as far away beyond your reach. You don't even know what happened to them. They took everything. So if, if, they, if they were watching your house, they took your dog. Um, or, or they took your laptop with all your information from work on it. They took your best tools. They took your, your, your sewing needles. They, 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 they took your cell phone. They, they took whatever was most important to you is gone. And so is this person who was a big help to you gone. No word, no warning, no two week. This was just gone. How would you feel if you were Philemon? Disappointed, to say the least? Angry? Bitter? Maybe you'd go back over the timeline of how you knew this Onesimus, and maybe you're thinking, oh, I, the signs were there. I should have known this all along. Oh, maybe I could have done something different. Oh, but he's just such a crummy human being. Ugh. I hope he gets what's coming from him. I hope he took a boat, and on that boat there was a storm, and then the storm caused the boat to sink, and then he was floating, and then a shark got him. I hate Onesimus. Very relatable. So you got Onesimus who did wrong, and you got Philemon who's still there, 
suffering from the damages. And then you got Paul that steps in the middle. And he says, Philemon, our dear friend. He addresses him as our fellow worker. And also, Appia, most likely his wife, calls her sister. Archippus, probably their child, a fellow soldier, another preacher. And to the church that meets in your home. Early Christian church, they wouldn't gather at a building. Most of the time, they would gather at each other's house, whoever could host a larger amount of people, like 30 to 50. Philemon had his home offered, most likely maybe then a preacher, too. So he's appealing to him with a lot of nice words. But as you go through the whole letter, I think you can tell they, they weren't just words. They weren't just empty words of flattery. This is genuine. Philemon, he had the church meeting with him. He's the one who Paul brought into the faith when it says that, you know, you owe your very self to me. There was a close connection there. The word agape is used eight times. The word for love or a form of love, the self-sacrificing kind of love for this brother in the faith. And kind words of family, ten different adjectives throughout this that are just really strong, tying in this bond, reminding us all that Philemon was a good guy who had been hurt really badly. A good example of leadership, though, you're appealing to what is good, what is right. And then he starts off that letter, like Paul does with many of his letters, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been hurt, if you've been crushed, if you've been robbed from, if somebody said or did something that just tore you apart because you trusted them, Paul says, remember who you are, remember whose you are. Grace and peace to you. And notice this, there, there's something important about that order. Grace, God's undeserved love, and then comes peace. Like he's reminding him what's so very important that he has in God. Reminding all of us, first and foremost, who he is. Before he tackles this difficult, challenging problem of this relationship. So, addressing a difficult topic carries the greatest strength when it's addressed from shared faith. From shared faith. And that's what they had going for them. And I think that's really important. I, I mean, we get hurt by all different kinds of people out there in the world. But understand that this is not a museum of saints. Church is not a whole group of pe perfect people who have it all together. We come to this place on a regular basis because we understand we all have sin and we have a Savior. Sometimes that sin gets the best of us even in this place. And, I, and I'm not saying anything just happened recently. This is just something that's really good to be aware of on a regular basis. That in the past, in, 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 in the previous months, maybe in the months to come, in the years to come, there's going to be moments for you to really get angry with fellow Christians. In your own immediate family, but also in this body of Christ. Here's a good pointer. Remember what we have in common and what we go back to that brings restoration. The grace of God. He gave us undeserved love before we could earn it, before we could deserve it, in the midst of all our yuck. Therefore, we look around at fellow sinner saints who need some more of that grace too. Relate back to that. And that's why he has such kind words. And he, he says, I always thank God when I think of you. There's a bold statement. What is your prayer life like? When you're thinking at nighttime, you're praying over your day, is it like, Lord... Ah, my leg hurts again. Please help my leg not hurt. Oh, Lord, my kids, I don't know what to do with them sometimes. He's saying a good chunk of his prayer life, he's thinking about these other Christians, and instead of bringing to mind um, things that you're bitter about or frustrated with or, or disappointed with, highlighting one thing before God that you're thankful for about them. Think about that for your own life. What difference that would make with your mindset. If in the morning you get up and you're thanking God, when something comes to mind that hurt, also something that you're thankful for about that individual. Different way of thinking about things. That's the body of Christ. That's the value we have as we assemble together on a regular basis before the throne of our Savior who forgives and loves and restores. I always thank God as I remember you in all my prayers because I heard your love and his holy people, your faith in the Lord Jesus. So he brings it back around to the topic of love. If there's this conflict between Onesimus and Philemon, how are you going to bridge that gap? Well, you have a common faith. 
because Onesimus came to faith while he was away. Somehow he rubbed shoulders with Paul. And if anybody rubs shoulders with Paul, they're going to hear about Jesus. And if they hear about Jesus, then the Holy Spirit's going to work through that message. And Onesimus was brought to faith. So they have this common faith. What else do they need? They need some of this love. Because, I mean, ultimately he could force the issue. Paul, an apostle. Philemon, a guy that hosts people at his house. He could just go over and say, look, I'm an apostle. You do what I say. I have authority. Yeah, follow me around. I have been to mission churches after mission churches. You've got to listen to me. He says, I don't want to order you what to do. Instead, I'm appealing to you on the basis of love. Here's the foundation we go back to. Philemon, you are a sinner who's been forgiven and loved. Onesimus is a sinner who's been forgiven and loved. Let that be the thing that calls you to forgive your brother. Even though it hurt, love. First John says, we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. We remember what Jesus did for us. That same context, though, is pretty straightforward and strong as it continues and says, whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they can see cannot love God whom they have not seen. There's this connection between if we have, uh, are harboring something against another Christian, another person, if we're bearing down on that and it, our mind is, keeps going back to that and we will refuse to forgive them, in fact, we hate them, how can we say we love God? There's a simple way that we remind ourselves of this reality every single Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Hmm. If we are having something that is in our mind, in, in, in our head, against someone else, God's inviting us to apply the same kind of grace that he's given to us to them. And it all is based on love. There's the foundation. If you want to rebuild something, you've got to go back to that good, solid foundation. The common faith we share and a self-sacrificing kind of love. I don't need to get my way first kind of love. The foundation for forgiveness is love. And when that love hits, then you can start to dream about what it could be once that foundation builds up to a beautiful building and structure of a relationship again. He hinted at that. He said, perhaps you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So I know it hurts. I know what he did was bad. But in the common faith you share, in the love that you've been shown, dream about what this restored relation could look, look like in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. Instead of just being one of your workers, instead of just being a helper around the house, now he's like a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder fellow brother part of your family. That's better by far. Dream of what this could be. Instead of going back to all the things that hadn't been. Good wisdom, right? How sweet would that be? When, when, when Philemon's there getting this letter and then Onesimus comes in there and he's reading it right alongside of him and, and, and Philemon's able to actually put his hand on his shoulder and say, brother, you hurt me. It hurt bad. I did not expect something like that to come from you. And I've been forgiven a lot of big things in my life, and I know that the Lord forgives you, and I also forgive you. How sweet a moment like that. Something that I just belong for. They're restored. Forgiveness in that moment, but also understanding that it's a process that began with that first step. I say forgiveness is a moment and a process. You, you understand, like, it's, it's a moment. I say, I forgive you. But it's also a process because our brains, they love to bring up things of the past, and you're going to be ending up forgiving them another 10, 20, 30 times as the hurt maybe resurfaces or something else happens. Maybe understand what forgiveness is. It's not saying it was okay. It's not giving them permission to do it again. But it is saying, I release you from my personal desire for revenge. I release you. I release you into the Lord's hands. 
He knows how to deal with these things way better than I ever could. I release you. I'm no longer going to carry this burden around anymore. Let's be at peace. It's a moment. It's a process. Both of those things. It starts with that first step. A first step that, wow, that was quite a process, a chain. It was a first step that started when the Lord brought Onesimus to meet Paul. And then, and then Paul worked with Onesimus. And then in a common sharing of faith and in forgiveness what Christ has done, Onesimus decides that he's going to go back to the house he robbed and the person he hurt. The consequences for a runaway slave were not good. Philemon would be in his rights to really hold it against him in a lot of different ways. Why would he do that? Why would Paul want to get involved in this yuck of somebody else's garbage? Why would Philemon eventually receive him as a brother in the faith? None of that ultimately makes logical sense or doesn't sound fair, but it comes together around the cross. It comes together around the one who is willing to sacrifice himself for us, the one who died in your place and my place. There's grace there. There's forgiveness there. All those little steps, God's handiwork along the way. So, has anybody come to mind? Who's your Onesimus? Or maybe your Onesimus, and who's your Philemon? Who's a name or a face right now that you're thinking, oh, that stinker, I can't believe they did that. Or another person, a face, I, I can't believe I hurt them, and it's been so long since we talked. I think it's clear what Philemon teaches us. As far as it depends on you, work towards reconciliation. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And enjoy and bask in the peace that comes when that happens. As far as it depends on you. Again, it might be that death has severed it so you can't actually talk to them anymore. Or they may not want to talk to you anymore. But as far as it depends on you, to forgive. To bear the sins before the cross. To walk away refreshed. I had a, I have an uncle, I have an uncle, who's, when he, when he gives you directions, you're never really sure which, to go, which way to go, because he's not very clear. But also, when he points something, his finger goes off to the left a little bit. It, it's, I, I don't exactly know what happened, but he broke his finger in his 20s, and um, it healed, and it goes to the left. <laughs> so, it's kind of weird. I, I read that if you really want to um, fix a bone that's healed improperly, you have to break it again or have surgery where they saw it and then reset it. Ugh. Painful, challenging. Forgiveness is kind of like that. When it's not there, we can move on and we can grow off of it, but it's kind of crooked. And it affects our other relationships as well if we haven't learned how to work through that forgiving process. But in Christ, things are reset. And we know that because of the way Paul started, grace and peace. And you know how he closes this letter? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The, the air the, the, comes into your lungs. The new life that you have in Christ, the person you are in your baptism, grace. So I'm in a safe place to work through these things, to work with these people and move forward. Amen. I invite you to please stand. Let's join in confessing our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare to bring our gifts to the Lord. Uh, there's an offering envelope in there as well as a way to text to give if you're so moved. A couple things to highlight as we're preparing for that. California Lutheran High School is hiring. That's our local Lutheran High School down in Wildemar. A uh, great school. They're looking for an administrative assistant that's going to be working the school hours. So basically, I think like 7.30, 8 o'clock until they get done around 2 or 3. So if you're looking for a job and you can do some administrative stuff, it's a little bit of a drive. But it's a cool environment to work. Annual blanket drive, donations needed. Every year we get together blankets, like um, building our own blankets. We get fabric that's donated or um, gift cards to Joanne Fabrics. And then groups of people across our campuses, also in our communities through social media, pull together. And I think they did about 5,000 blankets last year. And then they were donated to Riverside County Police. And then they're shared with people throughout that next year as the people have need. So if you want to get involved with that. Uh, Nina Acosta is the contact person, Nina. And I can get you her digits afterwards. I'll let you know. Church camp out. Today is something special. Today, it's Toby's birthday. That's my son. But besides that, September 15th to the 17th, there's a camp out. Today is the last day. It's that pre-registration cost. It's going to go up $20 next week. Yeah, you don't want to pay an extra $20. If you've been on the fence, now is your time to register. It's pretty close to this campus, right? We're going to go to Herky Creek. Uh, we're going to have a great day camping Friday and Saturday night. And then there's going to be uh, games on Saturday, other activities, some downtime, campfire, potluck, worship outside, etc. It's going to be amazing. So if you want to get registered, that QR code will get you registered. It also came through the newsletter. There's two more. Hold, hold on. Here we go. One more. AZ California Missionary Conference is happening today. Well, we're getting there today, Monday and Tuesday. So Pastor Ben and I are going to go on a plane over to Vegas. We're going to be so busy we won't get distracted by the lights or any other shenanigans. But we will get together with a whole bunch of other missionaries. It's limited to about 50 um, pastors who are in a mission setting. And we take times listening to specific presenters, but in between we have commercials where each of us has to give at least two minutes on one thing that they have that it would be helpful to the brothers that in the mission setting. So it's a really great way for us to get to know each other and share resources. So we're going to do that, and we'll be gone uh, mon uh, tonight through Tuesday night. But we'll have our cell phones on us, so if you need us, let us know. All right? And finally, Faith Moves Mountains, Save the Date, first ever all-campus celebrating together worship, ministry planning meeting, fellowship meal. Every year we have a Crown of Life annual meeting that's been at each campus individually after church. You don't get to see all of Crown of Life in that way. Also, I don't know, it just seems a little bit kind of off to the side, like a 15, 30-minute thing. This year we want to do something really big and special. Um, pastors, along with volunteers, along with Crown of Life leadership, has pulled together a great ministry plan for one year, three year, 10 years at Crown of Life. And we want to share that with everybody so that we're aware of it, so we know what the church is going to look like next year and maybe three years from now with the Lord's blessing. We're dreaming big. We're excited. And we want to share that. That might be a little challenging, though, to get together. So understand, we want to get together for 9 a.m. worship in Riverside. We're not going to have a worship service at Ukaipa or Corona. We're coming together at Riverside for 9 a.m. worship, and then a 10 a.m. meeting, and then 11 a.m. potluck uh, catered-in meal that's going to be really good. And then noon, we're going to be done, and we're going to go our separate ways celebrating. That's the plan anyways. If someone visits on that Sunday at Ukaipa or Corona, we'll have a volunteer stationed at Ukaipa or Corona with coffee and donuts, welcoming them, explaining what's going on, and inviting them to come back next time. And then after that, the volunteers are going to join us at Riverside. 
if anybody can't get there because of the distance from Yucaipa to Riverside or from Corona to Riverside, we're going to have um, some coordination of drivers as well as if we really need to, we can get a King's Kids van, 10 passenger van over here, load you up, we'll get over there and get you back. Cool? So there's really no excuse not to participate in this really neat event. Cool? Okay. If you have questions about that, let me know afterwards. We did put that on the newsletter this last Friday. We'll be talking more about it throughout the next couple weeks. November 24th, save the date. 9 a.m. worship. September. September. Did I say November? <laughs> See, that's it. Well, it's good that you're here. 924, September 24th. We bring our gifts to the Lord. All right, we close with our final prayers. I invite you to